helping us once we uh, focus on those visions and those missions, coming up with the structures of how do we create the future? What does the strategy look like that we need to create in order to implement these things? And then putting the power behind it to operationalize. Yeah. So you're involved early in the process, well before anything might end up in Gmail or Google search. And some, some of the stuff is not destined for these familiar Google products at all. Yeah, that's right. So inside of our organization, inside of Google research, we're talking about things all the way from ideation to product, sometimes landing in other places, not even products. So it's, it's really a, all along that innovation life cycle. Do either you or Google in general have an official definition of, of exactly what responsible AI is? I'll tell you this. Um, we certainly have an opinion on what responsibility is. So we have been engaged in uh, activities around responsible AI, working on that for a long time, um, over a decade. And in 2018, we created... AI principles, and you all can go and take a look at them. They're published, they're widely available, that we need to ground ourselves in, and we utilize not just as principles, but also for process and for governance for how we act. Can you give us an example or two about those principles? Sure, but I'd be happy to. So um, one um, is um, be accountable to people. Uh, Another is, uh, for instance, um, don't um, uh, enable or create bias. So we were um, very uh, clear, in addition to being um, very ambitious, when we created these um, uh, principles. Another one that we anchor ourselves in, I think most of us at Google think about every day, is... Um, uh, be something that improves society, right? And be beneficial to society. But there are seven. I'm not going to pretend like I can rattle them all off because there's a lot to hold in my head at one point. But I can tell you this, we certainly reference them all the time. And since we have to pre work within a structure that references them, uh, they're top of mind. Given uh, the incredible pace of change that AI is going through right now and probably will continue to go through, was it even possible back in 2018 or even earlier to understand what you needed to think about in order to establish guidelines that wouldn't become obsolete the, the moment AI got better? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, over the course of my career, and it's been a long one, fairness has been um, at the core of um, a lot of my activity. And I'll say this. The foundations of fairness are durable, right? And so the activities that people are undertaking, and I have some fantastic colleagues who um, also focus day-to-day um, -day on responsibility and AI, those durable foundational ideas certainly 10 years ago, 15 years ago, yeah, you can start to work on them so you don't start the engine cold on what fairness looks like. So how do you contextualize things? How do you make these decisions around? And how do you apply principles to improve outcomes? And given that AI is touching everything these days, um, can you come up with AI guidelines that apply to image generation and medicine and search and uh, everything else where, where AI is, is changing the world at such a rapid pace? Yeah, uh, you know, we uh, have a lot of activity that's happening around solely around responsibility when it comes to AI. Uh, since 2012, we've published over 300 papers um, on responsible AI. And then we have seen, as you pointed out, an acceleration of our need to review what we do. We have um, principal reviews for AI and uh, I'd say in the last year, they've doubled. We've done about 500, and they do focus um, a, a large number of them on generative AI. Now, it's, um, it's not news that we're seeing a lot of examples of, of AI creating unintended consequences and the companies that create it needing to figure out on the fly what to do about that. In some cases, that company is Google, so it's, it hits close to home. 
is does that just kind of par for the course for, for this technology? Um, or are there things you can do to at least limit the amount of cases in which unanticipated stuff happens, particularly at this early stage that you're involved in? Yeah, I think it might be, um, it's interesting to say, but Harry, I actually think it's both. So uh, what do I mean by that? So you ask, are there things that we can do in order to um, lower the incidence of bad outcomes? Absolutely. And we try to do those things. But I'll say this also, as you know, as I know, um, things continue to evolve, right? And it's a moving target in two respects in terms of the technological um, advancements, but also about what is fair and what um, where we are because the discourse around fairness and responsibility. And so um, it's clear that when things, when, when there are mistakes, there has to be a uh, responsibility and then an ability to say, hey, remediation has to happen. We got to take care of this. And we try to be a company that's responsible about that. And um, are you personally involved in, in some of those decisions or are, are some of the difficult stuff that's happened? Right? How close does that come to, to your role? Uh, you know, look, um, if, if there are two lenses I would, I would, I would cast this through. One, um, of course, in my role as a leader in Google Research, which is the birthplace of ideas, which is one of the places where, yes, these technologies have been born, I personally feel a sense of responsibility and have um, agency in, in certain ways. But I would also point out that we as a, an organization have a responsibility for all of us. So all of us are meant to be uh, aware and understand our AI principles and to guide ourselves and to create structures around um, how we encounter them in the work that we do. And that's not a small thing. Um, I always say, you know, how a company starts matters. Our mission for us matters. And we actually see being responsible about AI as part of our mission. Google invented a lot of the foundational stuff that, that made generative AI across the industry possible. I imagine you're working on research right now that hasn't played out at scale yet, but will. Um, you have an incredible amount of resources at your command when it comes to this research. Um, does Google bear more responsibility than, say, some small startup to get some of this stuff right just, just because of the, of the likelihood of what you create having the kind of impact that it, it probably will? Look, we, do, we touch so many people. Yes, we feel that we have a lot of responsibility. That's why we have so many structures that we've created, and that's why we engage so deeply. Um, even I have spent uh, the time here in a way that I think might surprise people. So, you know, I'm here, and you want, you're, you're listening to us, and you know, we're having a conversation, and you are listening to us speak. But there is a piece um, that... I engage in more often, which is listening. So I've traveled around to the different stages, listen to the conversations, because we have to be part of the conversation and understand really what's happening. How are people feeling? What are we meant to respond to? What does that responsibility mean to all of us? So um, it's a it's a wider discourse than than one would think. Google is also a company that inherently does stuff at global scale. Um, I don't think there is an impact. Or do, to what degree does that impact how you think about this stuff, given that North America is one place with, with kind of one, one group of people, but that is not the only place that the, what you're working on is going to touch. Right? Yeah. You know, this is interesting for me in two dimensions. I keep on doing that, two dimensions, but there are so many different dimensions. So I spent about 10 years outside of the U.S., living in South Africa and Kenya. And um, I also bring a lot of different perspectives, and some of them quite rare, um, being a Black woman, for instance, to these conversations and to the different strategies. So I apply many different lenses to how we can accomplish the things that we do. But um, it's about having a diverse, um, uh, diverse voices at the table, but also we happen to benefit from the fact that we are around the world. 
I don't know if you so can. Google research is around the world and we have people who are part of the conversation who inform us of these um, different contexts. But it's not just an informal process. It's also a formalized process where some of our research areas are around understanding how context plays into um, the output of AI. A wonderful team uh, that works on a, a, a project called Scouts, for instance, that focuses exactly on this. We have, a, you know, an aspiration to be able to serve and support a thousand languages around the world. So we're not an organization that is focused just on the U.S. And that adds complexity. But it's necessary. And that would be good because like, Give us an example or two of some of the things you learned in Africa that might come as a surprise to at least most of the people here. Oh, no, I'm not sure it would surprise everyone here. Um, you know, the language work is uh, quite interesting. And here's the thing about languages that uh, I find, how would I put it? Uh, I find it both um, inspiring and hard to pin. You know, we, we, we tend to think about languages as something very um, static. It is what it is. These are the words that are part of a language. That's not the, that's not the reality. Some languages, for instance, um, there are combinations of Swahili and English um, and that continue to evolve. I'm just giving that as one example. And so the languages, like there are these fusions of two languages that create um, something that continues to evolve and really um, fade in and, and out of its adjacency to other languages. Um, there's some fantastic work being done on the continent around um, climate, around food security. I don't know that um, it would surprise people. I think people would be surprised about the things that we're doing there. For instance, um, this is global. We're, we're doing work on flood forecasting, applying AI to trying to give... Um, everyone uh, in 80 countries at least seven days warning about um, floods. And that's even in places where um, there's data scarcity. So the people can protect themselves. That's just one example of, of work that we're doing that we find really important um, that people might not know about uh, responsible AI. Google, uh, as well as leveraging AI and all these products we all know and use, does you are tackling some of these big issues the world has. Where AI has a lot of potential, and we probably don't talk about it enough, given how easy it is to get fixated on on AI's risks. And yeah, there's a lot of focus, of course. I know people, and I, and I don't want to play it. I think I understand why people are so interested in, for instance, the large language models. I'm interested in it, too. And, I, and there are so many things happening when it comes to AI, so we don't talk about all of them. Um, you know, there's work. I don't know how all of, all of us got here, but, you know, we've got, probably got here, a lot of us, on, on airplanes. And we have work that we've done on contrails that we're really proud of. You know, some researchers looking up in the sky and saying, like, what are those white things that are behind planes? Well, it turns out that quite a few of them contribute a lot to uh, climate change. And so they said, well, we think we can work with airlines to try to decrease that. Uh, the, and, and we've done a really uh, wonderful job on that. You can read about that work. But it's not, I'm not here to tell you about all the different things. There's so much that's happening. We focus in Google research in part on that, that impact we can have in science and society. But, um, but I, I also understand why people are, are focused on these large models, too. Is there anything else that's kind of fundamental to um, the whole idea of responsible AI that um, those of us who don't think about it for a living may not understand? We try to break our own things so we can learn from that. <laughs> oh, so I always find that um, something that people don't know is that there's a process that many of you probably do know about called red teaming. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the vulnerabilities and the outcomes that we are uh, not wanting from our own tools and technologies. And so there are processes, both internal and external, that we engage in trying to have those surface to figure out what they are. And, you know, some people might say, well, isn't that just a cycle? No, it's an important part of the cycle that you can expose those vulnerabilities or those outcomes that, that we don't want and figure out a way to solve them. And we do it both internally, we do it with partners externally, and it's a really important part of responsible AI. And even now, what we're, I think if you all listen to IO, you might have learned that there's a way of using AI to do this too, AI-assisted red teaming. And we're gonna, we're gonna do the best that we can. There are 
a whole bunch of uh, current issues with AI that leap to mind, including things like uh, its propensity to hallucinate, uh, the fact that if there are biases in, in the data, AI will, will spit out all the, all the biases that you've created in the first place. Um, I know that Google and other companies are, are working on all of these, but is there a chance that over time at least these will be solved or at least will be ground down to very small problems rather than the fundamental issues the world has to deal with? We're hoping so. I mean, that's what we're focused on quite a bit. So, for instance, the issue around one issue around bias and, uh, and then skin tone, which I uh, can certainly relate to. Um, the, some of the AI tools and technologies created um, outcomes that we didn't want for people of different skin tones or, or inhibited our ability to utilize the AI the way um, people of lighter skin tones could. So, for instance, we partnered with um, Harvard professor, um, Dr. Ellis Monk, and created the Monk Skin Tone Scale to improve those outcomes. Just one um, way that we feel like, okay, so for that piece, we can address that and improve so hopefully we can start we can tackle other things we have so many things happening but for your career like perfection as a goal yeah i don't want to um you know sugarcoat it's it's not something that um i don't know if it's ever achievable i don't know if it's you know uh but but i certainly can say that it's a it's a worthy enterprise trying to make things better is it safe to say that as some of these things um, you make progress on There'll be new challenges we're not talking about yet that, that, that will come to the fore over the next few years. I have never found something that doesn't have new challenges. <laughs> so I can say, you know, we try, to be, we, we try to balance. We say bold and responsible. Anytime you're being bold, there are going to be challenges. But we have to be, we're going to be responsible about it. We're going to do our best. But that's, um, it's uh, to a certain extent, when you're trying to push forward, yeah, and yeah. help Congress, you know, and, and, that and they're putting it up. And overcome some of these big challenges, you're going to have uh, obstacles in your way. Thank you all. Thank you.